As far as I know, the case involving this first sketch we're going over has not actually been solved, and relative to most of the cases I do cover, it's pretty obscure without too much information out there. Anyway, this one could be dated back to around 2016 when police received a call from a woman about a man looking at her through a slit in an apartment window. This occurred in Citrus Heights, California, and later on, another woman claimed to have been by the same man. Law enforcement stated around January to February of the same year, they received nearly a dozen reports about a peeping Tom. This man frequented the apartments around Fair Oaks Boulevard and Greenback Lane. One of the residents claimed that she was being spied on by this man and said the following, I don't know, he looks really creepy. It's kind of scary because I live in the very back of my apartment complex and it's not very well lit, so I would advise our apartment building to maybe add more light. After conversing with several different witnesses, the sketch that you have all been seeing is what the artist came up with. When presented to the women who saw the man himself, they confirmed that it looked very similar if not the exact same, with the eyes obviously being the glaring detail. He is often referred to as the big-eyed or bug-eyed peeper, but does go by some other names as well. It's also commonly believed that he may have jaundice, which is a condition that can cause your eyes and skin to turn yellow. It's estimated that the man is in his mid-twenties to late-thirties. For most people, inviting their newborn child into the world is a monumental day, and it was no different for a woman named Terry Dugard who gave birth to her daughter, JC, on the 3rd of May 1980 in Anaheim, California. Terry had split up with JC's biological father, Ken Slayton, and was in a relationship with a man named Carl Probin. Terry and Carl ended up getting married down the line and had a child in 1989. The family moved to Myers, California in 1990 in search of a better location to raise their kids. On the morning of June 10th, 1991, JC put on an outfit that she had prepared the previous night, which was all pink. She was particularly excited for school today since her class was going on a trip, but little did everyone know that this day was going to be filled with dread rather than joy. JC made her way to the bus stop alone, which really wasn't very far at all, but just as she was approaching the stop, a vehicle abruptly braked right next to her. JC was a bit startled, but didn't think of the possibility that whoever was in the vehicle was out to harm her. As she continued walking, a man stepped out of the car and used a stun gun on her. She was immediately knocked out cold, and that's when a woman came out of the car and tossed JC inside. In the vehicle, the woman had covered JC's head with a blanket after removing all of her clothing. Meanwhile, JC's stepfather Carl had witnessed the entire thing from a window and sprinted out of the house to try and chase down the car. But of course, he couldn't catch up. Carl told authorities that the vehicle was a Mercury Monarch and was able to provide details of the woman he saw in the vehicle. The following sketch is what investigators came up with. Initially, law enforcement were of the opinion that it may have been JC's biological father, Ken Slayton, who had abducted her. So they got in touch with Ken and, shockingly, he said that he didn't have a daughter. Terry had never told Ken that she was pregnant or had given birth to JC. So the first time Ken learned about his daughter was an officer telling him that she had been kidnapped. Investigators determined that Ken was being truthful about not knowing of JC's existence and deemed him as innocent. It was also suspected that perhaps Carl may have been the one to organize this abduction, but he was found to be innocent as well. A large search party filled with tons of volunteers were out looking for JC Dugard, while local news also attempted to spread the word of the missing child. There were even these small little pink ribbons tied all around the city, also symbolizing JC. But there really wasn't much progress in the case. There were of course some minor tips here and there, but nothing that led to major developments. Unknown to the public, the duo responsible for kidnapping JC was Philip Garrido and Nancy Bocanegra. Philip, simply put, was a really bad person. He frequently used illegal substances and led a life of crime. He also shared that when he was bored, he would find a school, daycare, or park, just some location that had a lot of children, and park his car nearby. He would then to the minors, sometimes for hours at a time. There was a case in 1972 where Philip had abducted a teenage girl and both beat and 
character over the course of several days to weeks. The exact details leading up to that event are a bit unclear, but Philip was using a variety of substances on the teenager in order to keep her in a sort of vegetative state where she couldn't really comprehend what was happening. When Philip was arrested for this crime, the victim never came forward to testify against him. Other cases involved his ex-wife, who stated that Philip had a nasty tendency to lash out in violence and was overall very controlling. During her first attempt to leave Philip, Philip actually abducted her and brought her back, but she was later able to completely cut herself off from him. Another incident occurred in 1976 where Philip abducted a woman in her mid-twenties in California. He then made the long 10-12 to 12 hour drive to Nevada where he brutally the woman for hours on end. Fortunately, Philip was discovered by a passerby and was arrested. He received a sentence of 50 years, and it was in the Leavenworth Penitentiary where he met a woman named Nancy Bocanegra, his partner in JC's kidnapping. In the 80s, Philip was transferred from Leavenworth Penitentiary, which was located in Kansas, to a prison in Nevada. He was then moved to Contra Costa County in California in 1988. At some point during his sentence, Philip and Nancy actually got married as well. Philip was released early around the same time and both he and his wife Nancy lived with Philip's mother in Antioch. And it was at this same location where JC Dugard was being held, specifically the backyard which had a bunch of little sheds and tents. And just as a side note, Antioch was often referred to as pervert's paradise due to the abnormally high amount of sex offenders living in the area. JC was handcuffed and placed in one of the sheds which also happened to be soundproofed. And for the first few days, Philip didn't really interact with JC all that much, but this did later change. It was around the one to two week mark when Philip started to assault JC in the shed. This occurred at least once or twice a week over the course of years. And we would later learn that Philip believed that he was sort of entitled to JC's body via supernatural entities. He was religious, albeit his beliefs were kind of skewed. He claimed that because JC was in her current position in front of him, then it must have been allowed by angels. And that his assaults are what God wants. And being that JC was just 11 years old at the time, which is a very impressionable age, many people believe that Philip sort of brainwashed her. But we will talk about that a little bit more later on in the video. And to make this situation all the more disturbing is that Philip may have solicited JC to others. Remember, Antioch was host to hundreds of criminals and it was reported by a number of witnesses that there would sometimes be lines of men near Philip's backyard. But whether or not JC was actually involved in any of these events is a bit hazy. Living about two to three streets down from Philip was a 46 year old man named Henry Mickens, who had served time after minors. So just a really scary and depraved environment. And just from a quick read, there were at least another seven to nine other men who had similar criminal histories living within walking distance of Philip's backyard. If you recall, I mentioned that Philip was a user of illegal substances. When using, he would have these times that he referred to as runs. During these runs, he would use a lot of and this could be from a few days to a week long. So during that span of time, Philip would assault JC more violently, then start crying and apologizing before again attacking JC. It was also shared that JC was tasked with comforting the man whenever one of these binges ended. After months passed by and Philip began to quote unquote trust JC more, he gave her a TV, but forbid her from watching the news on it. So she had no idea that there were hundreds of people out looking for her. And it wasn't until nearly one year after being kidnapped when JC finally saw Nancy. And surprisingly, Nancy sort of took up a motherly role with JC, but this quickly changed. Nancy, just like Philip, constantly switched between being happy and then violent. And you could probably expect that with someone as unstable as Nancy, she was bound to be jealous about the attention that JC was receiving from Philip. Ridiculously, Nancy even berated JC on one occasion, saying that it was her fault that she was kidnapped and her own life would be much better off if JC didn't allow for herself to be abducted. 
Then, three years after being abducted, Jacy was finally allowed to have her handcuffs removed. However, Philip and Nancy still kept her in the same bolted down shed. At this point, JC was about 13 years old. It's also at this age when Philip and Nancy told JC that she was probably pregnant, so the two trained her for childbirth, which occurred on August 18th, 1994, when JC was 14 years old. Nancy also had experience as a nurse, which played a large part in the successful delivery of the child. Additionally, it stated that while JC was pregnant, Philip completely stopped her, and then after the childbirth, the assaults overall were less frequent. Fast forward another three years in late 1997, JC gave birth to a second child. She was 17 years old at this point. JC was the primary caretaker for the kids, as you would expect, since Philip couldn't care less. She also feared that during one of Philip's runs that he would start assaulting the kids. JC was also commanded to tell her children that Nancy was actually the mother, while JC was just an older sister. And you may be be wondering to yourself right now why JC never attempted to escape or if she even tried. She did think about it at times, but she was just way too scared of the potential consequences if she failed to actually try it. This fear escalated when her children were born, so she felt that her best option at the time would be to just follow along with whatever Philip and Nancy wanted. And something that is pretty crazy to think about is that during this entire time that JC was being held captive, Philip was being visited by police semi regularly because of his parole. In the early to mid 2000s, there were several close encounters involving Philip, Nancy, and the police, but it wasn't until 2009 when the couple would finally be exposed. In 2002, the fire department actually visited Philip's residence after they called about a child injuring themselves, but this encounter was never shared with the parole office and Philip was not supposed to have a child near him. Then in 2006, someone called police saying that they believed that Philip was keeping kids in his backyard in those tents and sheds. A cop did show up, but they did a terrible job to say the least. He or she simply said, hey, if you got someone living here, they can't be outside of the building. You need to keep them inside. The officer didn't even bother taking a look at the backyard knowing Philip's history. The person who called the police explicitly mentioned that Philip was a deviant as well. And these are just some of the moments where Philip just slipped through the grasp of law enforcement. Now on to August 24th, 2009. This is when Philip's fantasy world started to fall apart. Philip paid a visit to UC Berkeley accompanied by JC's two daughters. Over the past few weeks, Philip sort of had this revelation of wanting to help others. As we already know, Philip is more or less addicted to but he also has some obscured religious beliefs as well. Anyway, he wanted to host an event where he could teach others how to control these dark desires which could lead people to do terrible things if they're not properly understood. Philip was led to a woman named Lisa Campbell who was the head of special events for the university. And during their conversation, she took note of the two girls that Philip brought along. Both of them just looked really sad and devoid of any life. Then, looking back at Philip, he did not look like someone who was quote unquote stable enough to raise two children. Lisa stated that he seemed as though he had just taken some sort of illegal stimulant and was all over the place when speaking. After their meeting, Lisa actually reported Philip to a police officer. This officer did a bit of digging and realized that Philip was on parole for and kidnapping. Lisa called the number that Philip had left with her and asked if he could come in the next day, to which Philip said yes. Yet again, he brought along the two girls, but this time a police officer was in the same room observing the entire interaction, and the officer immediately noticed how robotic the children acted. When Philip left this meeting, the parole office was informed about the possibility that Philip was violating his conditions. So, two officers were sent over to his residence and they detained Philip before searching the premises. However, they didn't find anything that was really all that suspicious. They were expecting to see children living in terrible conditions and being mistreated, but the children were nowhere to be seen. Nevertheless, authorities believed that Philip was up to no good, so they took him down to the station for further questioning. When asked about the two girls he brought to the university, Philip stated that they were simply kids of one of his relatives, and that he was simply babysitting. And throughout this whole case so far, we already mentioned a couple moments 
instance where law enforcement probably didn't do all that they should have with regards to investigating Philip. But thankfully, this time, authorities didn't just settle. They demanded that Philip swing by the station the very next day for more questioning. So this Nimrod actually comes by, but he also brings along Nancy, JC, and the two kids. But before stepping into the station, either Philip, Nancy, or possibly both of them told JC to introduce herself as Alyssa. Authorities questioned everyone individually, and they didn't suspect JC of, you know, actually being the missing girl from 1991 and she stayed firm with her identity as Alyssa. Even when told that Philip was a damn JC stated that he wasn't anymore. Then, when the children were also told that Philip was a bad person, they said similar things as JC, that Philip was kind and compassionate. But deep down, authorities believe that something was wrong here, so they kept pushing. At some point, JC got extremely irritated and it became clear to police that she wasn't about to put Philip in a compromising position. Then, surprisingly, Philip was the one to admit that Alyssa was actually JC Dugard, who he and Nancy had kidnapped back in 1991. And that's when JC finally caved and spilled the beans. Obviously, Philip and Nancy were arrested on the spot. As for JC, she and her children were examined by medical officials to make sure that they were all healthy. And indeed, they were. Investigators believed that Nancy's medical experience was a big factor as to why the kids never had to visit a doctor. And by this time, they were around 15 and 11 years old. Philip pleaded guilty to one count of kidnapping and 13 counts of assault which landed him a 431 year prison sentence, while Nancy received 36 years to life. Many people believed that JC suffered from Stockholm Syndrome and had fallen in love with Philip. However, she did come out and explicitly state that she was only doing what she had to to survive. She was simply adapting to her situation. 